Hello everyone, welcome back to Brombird News. I hope you're enjoying all the summer flowers. Aren't they just lovely? But at the same time, this time of the year, I call a raccoon and bear mageddon. I know we've talked about raccoons and bears earlier this year, but I find that it is now that they are eating as much as they can in preparation for the winter. And they've become regular backyard visitors in many places and not just at night, but during the day as well. So even if you haven't had a bear visit your backyard just yet, but you've heard about bears in your area, please just take your feeders down for a few weeks because nothing really survives a bear visit. They will destroy anything with food beyond repair and we're all trying our best to keep things out of landfill. Susan Rogg here sent us this footage a few days ago. We were all on the floor laughing. But raccoons are not bears, they are slightly more bearable. So if you have bird feeders hanging off tree branches, you can try securing your bird feeders with a zip tie. This way, raccoons will empty your bird feeder, but they will not drop it down, destroy it, or take off with it, never to be seen again. If raccoons visit your backyard at night, you can bring your feeders in at night and then put them out in the morning. But if that becomes too much work, I'm afraid a pole system with a baffle like our raccoon buster will be your best bet. Just make sure not to place your pole system right under a tree because we've watched raccoons go up a tree, onto a tree branch, pull it down to the point that they can reach the pole system, jump, and then your feeders are empty in no time. Brian and Heather Lumley are wondering whether it's normal for red-headed woodpeckers to be eating out of a, an Oriole feeder. They've also noticed rose-breasted grosbeaks, beaks, finches and other woodpeckers helping themselves to that Oriole feeder. Well, aren't you lucky to get a red-headed woodpecker visiting your Oriole feeder? But then again, I'm not surprised to hear that you're not only getting woodpeckers, but also tanagers, mockingbirds, finches and grosbeaks beaks joining your Orioles. Like Orioles and Hummingbirds, all of these birds also have a sweet tooth and as such are among the 50 or more species that will visit Hummingbird feeders. I don't know what kind of Oriole feeder you're using, but I'm guessing that the access ports are likely larger than the ones found in Hummingbird feeders, which makes it even more attractive to birds with bigger bills. If you're not already doing so, you might consider offering your Orioles some grape jelly in any kind of a shallow dish like a tuna can or a large salad dressing bottle cap fasten so that it doesn't tip or fall over. They apparently love it. And most folks are not aware that Orioles are also insect eaters. So if they're nesting in your yard, consider buying them some live mealworms from a pet store and placing them in your grape jelly container. The adults will readily carry them to the nest to feed their young, and you couldn't perform a more kindly gesture for these beautiful birds. It's well known among ornithologists tracking migrating birds between breeding and wintering areas that many species make pit stops along the way to take in some food and recharge their energy supplies by adding fat to the various depots inside their bodies. But new research has discovered another equally important benefit. They're giving their immune systems a much needed boost to prevent them from succumbing to disease or infection. Cass Eichenauer, an ecologist at the Institute of Avian Research in Northern Germany and his colleagues, they study the physiological components of avian migration. They consider these migratory birds to be super athletes, capable of running the equivalent of 100 marathons and performing at a rate of 100 times above their base metabolic rate. Mammals aren't even in the same class as birds. Because migratory birds often clump together with little social distancing during these pit stops, also known as staging or stopover sites, they risk picking up disease from other birds in close proximity. This is especially important in these times of heightened exposure to the rapidly spreading avian flu virus. To measure the levels of both innate and acquired immunity, Iconar's team captured individual birds from several short distant and long distance migratory species. They injected E. coli into their bodies and measured how well and fast it spread. The study showed that the birds that spent several days or more on these stopover sites definitely had higher levels of both innate and acquired immunity. The take home message is simple. We need to identify and protect these staging areas to give the birds a chance to safely make these necessary long distance trips. 
They are critical to the survival of our birds. Unfortunately, fall migration has already started and it's only August. So let's get ready to welcome those migratory birds. And even though you might not be hosting huge flocks of migratory birds, some of them will stop by to check things out. And one of the things they will be looking for is somewhere to rest and hide. So brush paths come in really handy. So if you're cleaning up your backyard, getting ready for the winter, please don't get rid of those brush paths just yet. I mean, you can keep them for the rest of the year, but if you don't want to, at least keep them for the migratory birds until this fall migration season is over. Here in the summer, we say where there is a lake, there is a common loon. I'm sure all of you have heard their mesmerizing songs. And since our town is on the lake, we went out in search of them. You've seen how frozen our lake gets in the winter, so there won't be any common loons here soon. They tend to hug the coastline of North America and Europe, believe it or not. I remember when I first moved to Canada, I was so fascinated to learn that a Canadian $1 coin is called a loony because of a common loon that's printed on it. Check it out. Male common loons are larger than females, but both sexes have these striking coats with black and white collar during their breeding season, and then their colors are not as vibrant for the rest of the year. Since these birds live on the water, their diet is, well, fish. Common loons tend to take naps during the day, and then during the nights they patrol their territory or they sleep on the water, but they do not feed at night. And often younger birds will evict older birds from their territory. And at the same time, younger birds take several years to establish a territory, but once they settle down, they tend to return to the same lake year after year to breed, and then they build their nests on the ground. And again, if the nest site is successful, they'll just come back to the same site year after year. They have only one brood per season with one to two eggs per clutch, and that's it. But common loons live for a really long time. 20 years is very common, but 30 years is not that loony. Their fall migration starts in August with the birds that were not successful at breeding. Then it's adults who manage to breed, leave without their kids. And then the juveniles are the last ones to join the fall migration, often waiting until the water starts to freeze. Well, that's it, that's all for now. Our photo contest is still open. It's birds and trees. Enjoy fall migration and harvest time. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks. <music>